thymic field mm -hmm. is a it's a voice resonating uh, field. Mm -hmm. So when you put your hand here, you can feel mm -hmm. the resonance of your voice. Mm -hmm. And if you saw um, the DiCaprio film, The Wolf of Wall Street. Oh, I didn't. Anyhow, at the beginning, uh, Matthew McConaughey uh -huh. shows DiCaprio the thymus thumb. Huh. And he does it to warm up his voice. So uh, your voice is so unique as far as uh, the power that it expresses. Mm -hmm. And I've noticed how many people mumble now. Mm -hmm. You know, they just talk down and they, you know, you can't, I'm hard of hearing anyhow. Mm -hmm. So I'm very aware of how difficult it is for me to hear a lot of people because they mumble. They don't, mm -hmm. or they have a very soft, low voice. They don't get this notion of, uh, uh, it, there's a kind of feedback issue here, I think. Mm -hmm. So if you hear your voice as something that's full of confidence and vitality and vigor, you get a feedback sense from that. Mm -hmm. And s sick people tend to get very diminished in their voice. <laughs> no okay. kidding. And also uh, resonance, right? Yeah, yeah, right. Like an like instrument. That. You know, and, and how many people get a sense of this thymic field? You know, where you really do have an emotive field here. The Germans have a word for it, which is Stimmung, which That's usually... Cool. Get, yeah, it's a great word, German Stimmung. Stimmung. And um, it... Um, yeah, if anybody else wants any. Ice cream? Ice cream? We got some before class. No, thanks. It might ruin your thymus field. It might... No, it wouldn't it hurt that. Yeah. <laughs> I'm too old to have that ruined by ice cream. We could put it in the freezer. Oh, you want some? Oh. Yeah, so, try a bit. That was close. So, Stimmung means mood. I mean, it's translated <laughs> as mood. Do you want mood. a spoon? Or? Yeah. Okay. Ooh, he's my spoon. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you can grab that part. I'm not sick. Yeah, I know. You didn't. Stimmung. You didn't know before I said that. S-T-I-M-U-U-N-G. At least a... Stimmung. Stimmung. Okay, wait, so what does stimmung mean? At first, it, I think it most basically it means tuning. Okay. And then the Germans use it for mood. And they have an herbal therapy developing in Germany called Umstimmungstherapy, huh. where you retune your immune system through herbs that enhance your immunity. That's that why sense. one reason why I like the word. Stimmung. So what does um mean in German? Huh? Um. No, ur. Ur You think of ur, yeah. Ur stimmung? No, no, no. Stimmung, right? U-N-G. That ends in U-N-G, right? What? Stimmung. Stimmung. U-N-G. Yeah. It ends in U-N-G. I'm talking about the um. Um stimmung. Oh, re. It must be retune. Oh. Or so um. Um. In, in Serbian, your consciousness is um. It um. is. Yeah. Huh. In German, leader is one of the great musical expressions of stimmung. Hmm. So I want you to write down Schubert and. Schubert's leader, Wait, where so he leader. sets he sets to yeah, music. Yeah, what is leader? Song, like, like lead. It means song in German. Oh, okay. How do you spell it? L i e d e r. Okay, I don't know that word. L i d e r. L i e d e r. You always pronounce uh, the i e. You always pronounce the e Lee. in German. Leader. Yeah, leader. Leader. And. That's one of the great expressions of German art are the, the leader, their, their mood songs. And uh, Schubert set to music the poems of Goethe. Mm. And the greatest uh, exponent uh, who died maybe 10 years ago was Dietrich Fischer Dieskau. So if you want to get into the German romantic mood, you listen to the songs of Schubert on poems by Goethe, sung by Fischer Dieska. <laughs> but Schubert also did two song cycles. One was called Die Winterreise, namely uh, 
journey in winter, and to Shanna Mullerin, the beautiful uh, Miller's daughter, also sung by Fisher D. Scott. They're, they're, to me, they're the, the, some of the most precious experiences I've ever had in music. And I got to hear Fisher D. Scott sing in person in San Francisco, where for <clears throat> the period of time they sang, I couldn't breathe. You couldn't breathe? No. It was so, yeah, wow. rapturous. Mm -hmm. So that's one legacy I want to give you guys. The German leader. How many we, more classes do we have left? Huh? How two. How more classes do we have left? After two. this one, two? One more. So this is the second to the last? I think. So next week's the last. Isn't it? We, see, this is week eight. There's two more. There are two more? There's yeah. Two more. Okay. Yeah. So this is the uh, third, third to last. last. Okay. That's good. So and I also wanted to bring up, uh, you know, That's looking at art of the period. So like, when we get to existentialism, which I think I'll do next Wednesday at the request of Herb Schmidt, who wanted to come for that, I'll set it up a little bit today if we have time. Uh, it's to look at uh, the art of the period, which is called Expressionism. So German Expressionism is the um, is in a strict alliance with the existentialist movement. And uh, my favorite of the group is Max Beckmann. And I had a whole uh, oh, fabulous experience with that. I'm studying at Harvard with, with Tillich. I'm his teaching assistant, in fact. And uh, it's a triumph of my life for this to have occurred. I'm lecturing every third time. And um, Tillich is one of the foremost existentialist theologians. And I'm also studying with Eric Erickson, who wasn't an existentialist, he was a psychoanalyst. But with great existential themes, he was a theoretician of human identity and a direct uh, follower from Freud. He was almost the successor to Freud, certainly in this country, and he had a, a huge reputation and a great following at Harvard, and he was my thesis advisor. So they have an ex exhibition of Max Beckmann at the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston. So I go, and here is Erickson. I mean, his whole theory of identity is played out with Beckmann, who did maybe 25, 30 self-portraits in the course of his painting career. His earliest uh, work was a self-portrait. So you could study the, his life cycle uh, based on his own self-portraits. So that was a huge thrill. And then all of the other themes that were worked into it. Uh, he had a nervous breakdown after the First World War as an ambulance driver. And there are paintings giving expression to that. And one is uh, a self-portrait that shows him manifestly disturbed, if not insane. And so I went so often, I finally wrote a review of it for the Harvard Crimson, the newspaper of Harvard. And I met Perry Rathbone, who was the uh, director of the Boston Museum. And he asked, my wife and I had to come over to his home one night because Mrs. Beckman would be there and he thought I'd like to meet we'd like to meet her. He Beckman himself had died some years before. So we went and met her. She was she would figured in many of his paintings. Uh, she was a model for him. Her name nickname was Quappi. Q U A P P I. And so she invited us to New York to see her paintings, which we did. That was a great event. And then she said, now we're going to go to uh, Mr. Beckman's dealer, Catherine Viviano. Okay. So we go to the dealer in New York, and she shows us the Beckman she has, and she had five lithographs that were about this big and about like that, from a portfolio he had done called Hell after he came out of the First World War. And uh, they were remarkable. And so she said, w would you like them? 
And I was a graduate student at Harvard, and I didn't have any money. And uh, I looked at Charlene, and she sort of rolled her eyes like, it's your call, big shot. Well, I knew that you could borrow money from Harvard for general household expenses at 1% interest a year. So I said, sure. <laughs> Assuming I could borrow the money from Harvard. This was a general household expense, wasn't it? These works of art? I mean, they go on the wall. Yeah. yeah. So there wasn't any problem about it. So I got it. I think I paid 2500 for the five. I imagine that was a good investment. I sold them at Sotheby's uh, just because, you know, it seemed like time to give them up. About four years ago for, I think it was between seventy five and 100000 <laughs> So that was, yeah, really. <laughs> I hated to see them go, but uh, anyhow, that's what happened. So that was a wonderful experience, and especially to have them, you know, in, in your life. Uh, to the extent that they were, they were amazing. Until you I, sold them, did you did you display them at your house? Yeah, right but I did one them? really stupid thing because of a kind of wayward generosity that is often not a good idea. I was real good friends with Manuel of Manuel's restaurant, uh -huh. so I gave them all five to him at one point. And he showed them in the restaurant, <laughs> and I kind of had to hold my breath that you know nobody would steal them. Anyhow, that was, that was fun to go there for a chili rellenos and see my Beckmans on the wall. Wow. Yeah, that was fun. And, <laughs> and, and Manuel was a painter, so, and he had kind of expressionist uh, style, so he really appreciated that. That was, that was fun to do. Paul, would you describe the expressionism, expressin ex express... Well, it, it's a... It's a version of vitalism in the sense that it came out of the turmoil of Germany after the First World War. And it was prototypically German. Uh, there was a, a group of them. One, one name they had was Die Brücke, meaning the bridge. And um, I think they, you know, artists tend to shy away from being classified. So I think probably a number of them didn't want to be called that Expressionists, even though they were. And it was the one uh, style of art that Hitler was specifically against. And he had this famous show called Degenerate Art, in which the Expressionists figured prominently. And they were all uh, to be condemned, if not destroyed. And uh, Hitler did what he could to drive all of them out of Germany or if they were Jews in the concentration camp. I mean, why did Hitler hate them so much? Because he was a Because he was such a Hitler. dick. <laughs> no, really. I mean, Hitler he Hitler fancied himself as an artist. You I think he's he, a repressed artist. He studied architecture. Oh, yeah, he was a painter. Yeah. Huh. He couldn't he, get into the and, program. And he couldn't get in, he, and that's why we got Hitler. <laughs> so <laughs> his... I didn't know that. His, his, the, the interest he had in style was as banal and maudlin as you could possibly get. I mean, just, you know, the, the trashiest kind of art was what he really liked. Huh. Big nudes and... He was a just, Velvet Elvis kind of guy, huh? Yeah. <laughs> no kidding. I mean, he just... And that's, that's what they favor. <laughs> what does Velvet Elvis mean? Velvet. Velvet art. Art painted on like paint on cheesy velvet. Painters. Yeah. yeah. Like cheesy. And, and typically it's either Elvis or the Madonna, <laughs> but it's very banal, <laughs> maudlin, cheesy. You know, I say this as, of course, my mother had one in her house. Bathroom. My mother was had cheesy, maudlin, banal taste. <laughs> you know, avocado green, she thought, was, you know, the, the, the end all and be all. I think it's interesting that you're bringing up German expressionism and existentialism and vitalism. Um, and I think it, it would just, because I know it really well, I know what it looks like. And so if you could just like, it's coming out of Van Gogh and mm -hmm. Gauguin. It's like figures, uh, bright colors in some mm -hmm. cases, uh, raw, like emotional. Mm -hmm. I think Hitler hated it because it was so emotional mm -hmm. and it would trigger such a visceral emotional response when you look at 
the paintings. Otto yeah. Dix is another big um, ex German expressionist. In fact, they just found a huge storehouse of Otto Dix paintings and all these other existential wow. or expressionistic Germans. Um, somebody had hoarded them all from World War, World, World War II, and a, a huge number of them were of these German expressions. Well, that's actually the movie is out, you know, Monumental Man. Yeah. By George oh, Clooney. Right. And yeah, I, that's I, the one. I, I, yeah. I saw the end of it, and I saw how they got it out of Germany. But uh, uh, so they did hoard a lot of art, whether they liked it or not. I understood that they didn't like it you can pass because that around it to get went against images of what the, the oh, I... middle class, the bourgeois values of of German culture, and they didn't like it because the values they they saw in it. That's what I had understood. Mm. Well, there was a huge critique of German culture, especially yeah. bourgeois culture, by the expressionists. Right. Mm. For instance, uh, German mm. businessmen. Um, very satirical, very distorted uh, in the, the critique of it, and uh, they're very famous for that. They were, uh, George Grosch um, was ruthless in his depiction of, you know, prosperous, uh, comfortable German. And there's, the, and there's some sort of irony behind it. There were some uh, released uh, documents that uh, there are pictures exposing uh, Adolf Hitler, who constantly practiced uh, emotion, who constantly practiced speech, long time, especially with controlling extremes of emotions, mm -hmm. <laughs> as well as being one of the few advocates for animal rights. <laughs> yeah. So you, you said expressionism is sort of an artistic expression of, of ways of vitality, mm -hmm. but expressionism is also attached to existentialism. Yeah. But existentialism mm -hmm. is not advocate, or, or, or it's the opposite of vitality, isn't it? Existentialism is connected to physicalism, isn't it? No. Existentialism is connected to vitalism. Okay, we'll get to that when we get to that. Yeah. Okay. And the, my point is that Existentialism is chief mourner for defeated <laughs> vitalism. So, oh. in a way, vitalism was defeated, and you got existentialism. Oh, okay. So it, it operates on that defeat, namely, our etwas failed, but something is missing. What's missing? The soul. How do you give expression to that? And that's what the expressions did. They they give expression to what's missing. What what industrial society has destroyed what they are up against as far as the coming fascist regime and the uh, mechanization of life and turning human beings into things under the hypnotic sway of a Hitler. And well, did I hear you define existentialism as the, uh, what did you say, the, the lamenting the defeat yeah, of... Vitalism. You, would you repeat that, please? Chief what? mourner for defeated vitalism. Yeah. This is my unique thought. Alex has a professor here who teaches a course where the first hour he talks about how great he is. And everybody sits there and listens to him uh, because it's his chance to inform everybody of that. Well, this is my one point in the sense of something that I actually thought. And I'm real proud of it. And uh, so here I had studied existentialism in school. I studied it at Harvard. Um, well, I came out of St. Olaf College, where the leading father of existentialism was Søren Kierkegaard. So that's where it begins, with Kierkegaard's reaction against Hegel. Hegel was an essentialist, namely completely rational. Uh, reality is rational, and uh, rational is reality. It's complete essentialism. It's all a movement of the spirit of God as though the spirit of God is the inner principle of reason in history and that has now come to full expression in Hegel. He is the summit of the whole effort on the part of reason in history to express itself and it does so in his philosophy such that everything has become essentially manifest and that's due to reason. Okay. Ugh. 
And it, it's, it's platonic in one register because Plato is often thought of as the uh, initiator of essentialism because of the platonic forms, which are called essences. Um, you know, you have a tree and you have what you could call tree hood. Namely, what is it that makes every tree a tree? So it's a kind of uh, elevation of abstract nouns into their highest expression. So Plato is considered the foremost essentialist because the whole realm of essences is something that he espouses in his philosophy. But there is also a strong existentialist strain in, play, in Plato as essentialist because of Socrates. Socrates was Plato's reference for uh, existence. I mean, it was the existence of Socrates, the being of Socrates in his existence that grasped Plato and transformed him. So people tend to forget the uh, influence of the existing Socrates on Plato when they talk about the Platonic forms and the essences and these abstract nouns. Uh, truth, beauty, justice, etc. Well, anyhow, Hegel carries that through to its uh, extreme. And so there was a reaction against Hegel, and it <laughs> happened with his colleague, Schelling. They were two of the foremost thinkers in Germany at the time. And Schelling has a kind of personal crisis. I think it had to do with the death of the wife of uh, one of his friends that he was in love with. There was a very famous literary critical family in Germany called the Schlegels, and Mrs. Schlegel dies, and Schelling had his heart set on her, and it, it shakes him up. And so he turns away from a philosophy of negativity, which he thinks of as essences, you abstract from existence, to what's essential, and he saw that suddenly as, as negative against the positive philosophy of existence, where we are here and now. So this happens in lectures that he gave in Berlin in 1841-42. And in the lecture hall, it, they were hugely popular, almost as if the historical moment of this turn away from Hegel, who was the most influential philosopher in the world at the time, enormous influence, both in Europe and in this country. And so, uh, Schelling's turn was so amazing as if it was understood that the lecture hall was absolutely packed. It was one of the great civic events of the time. People leaning in through the windows. You had to get there early to get a seat. And in the class are sitting Friedrich Engels, the colleague of Marx, Jacob uh, Burkhardt, the theoretician of the Italian Renaissance, um, the Russian anarchist, um, what's his name? Bakun? No. Bakunin? Bakunin. That's it. Bakunin and Kierkegaard. Well. So Kierkegaard takes about 60 pages of notes, which we have uh, extant. Hmm. And uh, he thinks Schelling hasn't really done it uh, in the way that needs to be done, namely radically. So he goes back to Denmark and really sets out to develop the major critiques of Hegel and the philosophy of essences in favor of a philosophy of existence. You can almost sum it up by saying, in Kierkegaard's words, Hegel built a castle of thought and lived in a doghouse next door. <laughs> and that just about does it. You know, and he just completely demolishes mm -hmm. Hegel. And it's one of the most brilliant efforts in the history of Western culture. So I get a big dose of that at St. Olaf College because my philosophy teacher, who introduced me to philosophy, was the translator of Kierkegaard. He and his wife translated all of Kierkegaard. And uh, <laughs> let me tell you, that some hundreds of volumes. I mean, Kierkegaard was so prolific. It was unbelievable how much he produced in the short life that he died. He died before he turned 40 and yet left these hundreds of uh, manuscripts and uh, a number of publications. Anyhow, so my teacher Howard Hong and his wife Edna were responsible for translating Kierkegaard. 
And then they established a famous library devoted to Kierkegaard at St. Olaf and visiting scholars who would come there uh, and so on. So I got a big dose of that. And then I went to uh, study philosophy further at the University of Minnesota, where another great Kierkegaardian was teaching, Paul Homer, and I studied with him as well. So then I go to Harvard to study with Tillich. And uh, he was right on a direct line, not so much influenced by Kierkegaard, but definitely by Schelling. He took Schelling as the greatest influence on his career. So you, you were you know, tapped into a guy who, uh, even though he had never studied under Schelling, was too young. Uh, Schelling had already died by some decades. Uh, yet the transmission was clear as far as the development that happened in Germany. And Tillich was you know, one of the foremost figures in the country, if not the world, as far as you know, what he commanded. He, he, was, he embodied the whole Western tradition like nobody else that I ever encountered or even knew about. And he transmitted it in his teaching in a brilliant way. So um, that's the beginning of existentialism. And I'll go in next time uh, into uh, talking about what the word means. You might look it up. It'd be real helpful if you guys Googled <laughs> essence and existence. Start with being. We'll have to start with being. That's the prime word. What is being? You know, the, the first philosophical question, which is regarded as a shock more than a question, is why is there anything, why not nothing? And that's called the ontological shock. And that's what gives rise to philosophy. It's a reflection on being understood as why is there anything, why not nothing? To be or not to be? I mean, that's the basic question. And it starts with Parmenides, the pre-Socratic philosopher, who takes a chariot ride to the vision of being. So if you would Google Parmenides and read as much as you care to of his poem, it's only like two or three pages long. And it's one of the great texts in Western philosophy because he writes his poem about his chariot ride to the vision of being. And it's amazing. So that sets into operation what we call ontology, the science of being or the logos of being. And it's very abstract. When I took metaphysics, which I told you was a synonym for ontology, that's what they called the course at St. Olaf. We read a book called Being and Some Philosophers by Etienne Gilson, who was a great figure at the time, Roman Catholic, but very much in the tradition of being, which is carried a lot by Roman Catholic scholars. I couldn't understand what being meant. I couldn't make the abstract move to the meaning of being. I mean, what is that? I, it was too abstract for me. And I had a brilliant friend, his name was Osmond Overby. And he knew what it was. And we'd sit there and he'd try to patiently tell me what being meant. And we had the textbook, which went through the whole philosophical tradition as far as a reflection on being. I, it was Greek to me. I couldn't get it. And it was interesting to think back on my inability to make the move that was uh, necessary, the abstract move to the meaning of being. It was too much for me. I, I couldn't do it. Well, so finally, I don't know how long it took, but by the time I got to Tillich at Harvard, then I, I knew what it was about. And I'd studied Greek philosophy. And so you gotta, once you kind of immerse yourself in it, then you begin to get it. Because it, it's, it's, you know, it's like the foundational subject matter. What is? And so according to the tradition, because it's a shock of, you could say, non-being, why is there anything, why not nothing? Well, nothing, what about the shock of nothing? You know, prior to your birth and upon your death. 
that's considered the shock of non-being. So you get shocked both ways. That there is anything at all, why not nothing? And then what about nothing? When, you know, you face it either way as far as the contingency of your birth and the fact of your having to die. And that was basic to Greek reflection. I mean, they, they brooded over that more than anybody I know. Yeah. Well, I, I also have a problem of abstractly conceiving being, but not as much as abstractly conceiving nothingness. I always wonder more when somebody uses the word, well, what about nothingness? I have trouble. Um, I, I, I would like. I, I would like it to be defined first, and then I could like mull it over. But I, I have a hard time with imagining what nothing, uh, nothingness, or what somebody means by nothingness. Well, just I think mean, does it mean ab the absence of everything, or does it mean uh, everything that we understand as existence? Well, start with your death. You know, anticipate your death, and uh, the fact that you can uh, meditate on having to die. So it's the process toward your death as well as the fact that, you know, you, you're stuck with it every time you think about it and even when you don't think about it. As far as how ephemeral your life is, I mean, that's a great Greek word. We're creatures of a day. And ephemeros, to me, that... I taught a course here once called Ephemeral Man because I was so enamored of the Greek word ephemeral. And the translation is creatures of a day, day creatures. Mm. That's how, uh, you know, powerful the Greek consciousness and sensibility was about life, that it was like living a day. And it, uh, it was... Yeah, okay. So, uh, I'll tell you a story. This is one of my favorite stories. <clears throat> I'm assisting Tilly. He was the hot shot of Harvard. He's applauded every time he gives a class, which was unique for Harvard students. But it got into a habit where you, you never didn't applaud him. And in fact, I gave every third class as his teaching assistant, and I was always applauded. And as far as my starting out in my teaching career, it wasn't good for me. You haven't been applauded enough since, have you? We've been downhill ever since, <laughs> believe me. No kidding, man. It's nothing like being applauded after you open your mouth. And uh, so here I am, Tillis giving a lecture, and the classroom is full. He had a very hypnotic pace to his voice. He had a very thick German accent. So often, if you heard him for the first time, you didn't understand anything he said because the accent got in the way. And I remember that happened to me when I first heard him. Uh, what did he say? I don't know. It was, the accent was too heavy. Well, finally, after listening, you got through the accent and didn't mean anything after a while when you were used to it. So anyhow, he had this highly accented German English, very rhythmic way of lecturing because he had notebooks that only had phrases. And he'd fill out the sentence by glancing at the phrase. And so that gave a further kind of rhythmic uh, character to his speaking. Well, it turned out that he was so fatigued that it looked like he was going to fall out of his chair. I mean, just got... And the class had kind of gone into a trance with him because of the hypnotic voice, further accentuated by the fact that he was so fatigued, which, which expressed itself. And I'm standing there on the side of the class thinking, if I don't say something, he could fall out of his chair and break his neck. Because it looked like that, I, I anticipated it happening. And everybody in the class is going like that. <laughs> And so I just, and he was lecturing on the shock of not being. Here, let me demonstrate it for you, class. Yeah, no kidding. So I just raised my hand because I thought it was an emergency situation. I had no idea what I was going to say. And I said, Professor Tillich, 
I understand what you mean by the shock of not being regarding one's death. That's perfectly clear. But I don't understand the shock of non being regarding one's birth. Because if I exist, then that's perfectly hypothetical. What's the shock? I can entertain the fact my folks never met and I might not have been born and so on, but that's not got the same force as the shock of non being regarding one's death. Hmm. The first is hypothetical. I thought, wow, man, that is really fabulous. Where'd that come from? <laughs> It's like the situation produced it. There are some uh, uh, videos on uh, YouTube uh, of uh, Tilly. I don't know if you have checked them. Uh. Yeah. So he, he woke up and he went, I don't even know if he heard me, but <laughs> he just kind of went, well, that's very interesting. <laughs> and then he went on with the lecture and I saved him from breaking his neck. How old of a man was he at the time? Oh, 70. Oh, wow. Yeah, it was the late 60s. And when was it? This would have been 1960. Okay. Yeah. And his last two years at Harvard, which is when I got to assist him. So it was kind of the triumph of his career. They have a very uh, elevated professorship at Harvard. There are only about six or seven guys that get it. They're called university professors, and he was one of those. So he was at the zenith of his career. And then, even though he retired from Harvard, he went to the University of Chicago, where he taught until he died for another seven or eight years. So anyhow, it was a great thrill to be associated with somebody that was as smart as he was <laughs> and uh, formulated things so clearly that nobody else could beat him. I mean, he, everything he said was like, uh, you know, taking a veil off. I'll, I'll give you one good example. How would you guys define education? Uh, lighting quarters of the mind. What? Lighting the corners <laughs> of the mind. Writing? Lighting. Uh, lighting. Corners of the light, mind. Lighting dark corners. Oh, of the lighting mind. corners of the mind. I like that. Yeah. Okay. I, it felt what? enriching, especially with your class. <laughs> <laughs> and her, yeah. And That's her as good as it. <laughs> <That's a> good. <laughs> So I got this from Tillich. Now, a rule of thumb is always go to the etymology of the word, which is what we'll do with the word existence. So e, ducere, which is Latin, means to be led out from. Okay, well you got that, and then Tillich would go on to say, to be led out from the narrow confines of one's birth. You know, you go, oh, that's, that's good. That's good to be let out from the narrow confines of one's birth. So don't forget etymology. And it's so instructive to look up a word as far as its original meaning, which usually takes you back to Latin or Greek. And uh, that's the word at its source. So... Heidegger was uh, into that too, you know. You know what, he'd even make it up. You know, I mean, he make neologisms that were really remarkable, which German lends itself to, at least as far as he was concerned. And he would go back to etymologies. Uh, and it, as a rule of thumb, it's an excellent thing to do. Yeah. You know, uh, speaking of cow comics, there was a professor right here who used to really like getting into etymologies and used to say what you said constantly to his students he would get into etymologies and he said famously the myth is in the etymology and who is that brown yeah yeah the myth is in the etymology and i knew what he meant by that time after a few years with him uh i ended up doing uh, knowing what he, what he meant by the Well, okay, now take this. This is just a little uh, sidebar. The, one of the best things I ever learned was uh, the meaning of certain words in Homer. I had to start my teaching career in the general education uh, course at Harvard, which they had recently revamped uh, in the late 50s. <laughs> in order to kind of really pick up the humanities. You know, it was suffering from the burden of the trend toward uh, natural science and experimental laboratory work and so on. 
the whole physicalist thing had kind of started to really diminish the humanity, so they, they, they revived it, they redid it. And they had this great offering of humanities courses at Harvard. Oh. Yeah. Also, to add into this idea of physical, <coughs> physical and vitalism conflict of human beings, either persons are either human beings or as things. Yeah. The common forms of reduction seem includes like racism, classism, ethnicism, gender. It's when I hear the word physicalist and vitalist conflict. It reminds me of various forms of reductionism, racism, classism, genderism, mm -hmm. human discriminatory social constructs, source of so power. What, what prompted you to bring that up? The prompt, uh, and in terms of talking about the humanities program at Harvard. I mean, it's funny you should say that because um, after I was outing, I left uh, UCSC in about 1972, 73. And so I came back up about 15 years later to teach a class with Ralph Abraham. And I felt like Rip Van Winkle as far as returning to the campus because I'd been away just long enough to, you know, it's like with you guys. I mean, I was then again away long enough to not get a good sense of what your uh, generation is like. And so I gave the first class and my nephew happened to be in it. Harrison Ford's second son. Harrison was married to my wife's sister. So because I was here, um, Willard came to study at UCSC and, and lived next door uh, to us with my father at the time. <clears throat> Anyhow, after the first class, Willard came up to me and said, you gotta be careful. I know, about what? We well, gotta be careful about what you say. I said, well, like, why? What are you talking about? He said, everything you say is monitored for racism, sexism, and class. <laughs> I went, oh, really? Yeah. So watch your mouth, pal, because everybody's on their tiptoes on the edge of their seat waiting for you to step into the trap. Well, that, that seemed like such an extreme warning, but he meant to inform me that this was the classroom situation. You had to be careful. What was politically correct, you know, just as John detailed it, was... Uh, Humans as things, reductionism. And I so there was such a reaction against that, called the politically correct, to safeguard anybody from saying something that amounted to an ethnic slur, or um, putting down women in a given way, or class. <clears throat> and that's what he was referring to. That was a big object lesson for me. So I was careful. And uh, I can see why. But it is a, a very difficult situation because it does hamper freedom of speech. And um, anyhow. I, I, I'm just curious. Why were they waiting? Were they waiting for you specifically? No, no, no. Just in general. Oh. Just and he knew I was kind of fresh to the game again, and the game had changed and tightened up, and that I <clears throat> I should uh, take this warning under advisement, which I did. Although it still perplexed me. Okay, so we were talking about the revision of the humanities program at Harvard. And so I get to teach uh, what they call Humanities II, the epic and the novel. We started with Homer. Why well, couldn't it have been better? I mean, it was just fabulous to begin with the Iliad and the Odyssey, have uh, the foremost professors of that field in classics give the two main lectures, and then you did a third section. So you really had to learn. You know, I, I think one of the reasons why I went into teaching is because I wanted to learn something. And you have to learn it if you're going to teach it. So it put that pressure on uh, really learning. And it was fabulous at heart because we had such bright students. There was always a little contingent of know-it-alls, namely guys that had gone to the famous prep schools, Groton and Exeter, and had this look on their face. They wore rep ties and, and Brooks Brothers uh, jackets and 
gray slacks and loafers without socks. And you couldn't tell them anything. And that's what their expression expressed. We, we know it all already. We're just, you know, you don't know as much as we knew in high school. <laughs> so what, what, what are we doing here? Okay, so that didn't really diminish the excitement of doing it anyhow. So what I learned in teaching Homer was how we could not read back into Homer advanced concepts that had developed by the time you get to Plato, which is what everybody did. So what do you mean? Well, the word for um, consciousness is psyche. In Homer, it's only mentioned when someone dies and their consciousness flies away like an exhaled breath. And that's actually the etymology of psyche is to breathe. So I thought, whoa, consciousness is the last gasp? What an amazing realization. And it isn't used in any other context than Homer. Well, and are they conscious? Well, they don't have a word for it. They, they, they only use the word for consciousness as the last gasp. Okay, then what about, uh, oh, my favorite is Tumas. This is used a lot in Homer, especially the Iliad. And it means courage or vitality. It's the, it's the heroic might of Achilles. He has... Tumos? Yeah, he has the most Tumos of anybody because he can kill more. And that's what he does. He's known as the manslaughterer. And what is the Tumos? It's a thymus gland. Now that hadn't been made in the time I was studying all this. They hadn't made the association to the thymus gland, which is so obvious to me once I realized it. Uh, another one is noose. That's the word for mind. So whenever the... Noose? N-O-U-S. Yeah. And what does noose mean in Homer? It means to smell. Hmm. And we still get a little sense of that. They say well, it doesn't smell right. Mind and that's what thinking meant in Homer, was hmm. basically the smell. Mind and smell? Yeah. Noose. Yeah. No. N-O-U-S. 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 Yeah, we have the word now in newology, which is a medical term for diagnosis. And T.R. de Chardin was famous for talking about the newsphere in the sense that everything is, is uh, intelligent. Hmm. Yeah. Was Homer before Plato? Oh, yeah. Okay. By a um, thousand years. So, Paul, when... From Homer, just basically meaning smell, news. Yeah. When did it become with uh, some of the uh, later philosophers? Like That's it. Associated? All gets worked out. When, so it, when did it become associated with the logos, with that mind, news? Through the pre-Socratic philosophers, basically with Heraclitus. With Heraclitus. He'd be the one. He was the uh, the main uh, meditator on logos, namely the rational world that makes. It's possible for our mind to grasp it through language. That's the logos, the rational structure of reality. So anyhow, it was so much fun to, to, to watch the etymological evolution of these terms from their, you know, their quasi-bodily relationship to abstract off into concepts and to have to train oneself to realize that there are no concepts as such, in Homer, they're quasi-bodily organs relating to these basic functions, but beginning to abstract off. So you can say that the Homeric figures are proto-rational. They're on the way, but it doesn't come into its fullest expression until you get to Socrates, and that's where it explodes. And that's why everybody before him, there's about 15 to 20 of them, who prepare the way by thinking this or that or this or that, are called pre-Socratics. I mean, I take that literally, rather than just as a historical contrivance to talk about 
figures that occurred before him. No, it's a, it, they're working at it. And they, they set it up and they advance it. And then all of a sudden Socrates is the one in whom it breaks through. And it's such a breakthrough. I love comparing Socrates to Jesus the Christ. And Plato, as the gospel writer, proclaiming the gospel of Socrates, just as the gospel writers, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, proclaim the gospel of Jesus the Christ. And there are many similarities. So anyhow, that was a big, uh, you know, eye-opener. And it only confirms that the more you go back to the original meanings of words, you, you, you find out these things that are otherwise uh, fairly hidden. Or alien. Huh? Or alien. Yeah. yeah. Are the Homeric hymns before or after the Iliad and Odyssey? What? Are the Homeric hymns before after. or after? They're after. Yeah. Okay. So, I'm having some trouble with the idea of Homer being on the, not being rationally self-conscious, not having the, having um, uh, nation, I guess, uh, concepts. Um, whoever Homer was, or the group of people that some scholars think Homer was, um, I have a hard time trying to understand how I can read Homer, how anybody can read Homer, be because we're reading concepts. We're, uh, he's a writer. No, you have I, to just make the correction in your mind. So you can't help it if you read the word mind and you think of mentality rather than smelling. So you make, first of all, read the book that opened us up for me. It's called The Discovery of the Mind okay. by Bruno Snell. And that's the Bible for opening your eyes to the meaning of these words at their outset regarding Homer. And then one of the biggest uh, uh, flips you've got to make is that Homer is exclusively oral. So when you read him, you already moved into a, a universe that is completely foreign to Homer. Huh. It's all been, it's all transmitted by word of mouth, and the mentality that goes with it is what we would call primitive or tribal or almost completely emotive imagination, which is why there's no concepts okay. and why there's no thinking about things. You don't get reflexive self-consciousness until you get to Socrates, who's always questioning because it's broken through with him. Okay. So we've got Homer, that's what I was getting to. We've got Homer, the oral poet. Yeah. Okay. And then we've got the writings. I'm talking about the writings. When I'm, you know, <laughs> I'm reading it, I'm thinking of a writer. I mean, a writer has to be so First of all, you'd, you'd have to, to read it. To you'd have to read it in Greek in order to get close to it. Yeah. So because you read it in English, you're that far away from it. And moreover, you have 12 translations to choose from, all of which are different. Well, and what you're saying is that's an oral story. Yeah. You know, even whatever is written down in Greek wasn't necessarily whatever the, happened thousands of years it's, ago. You, you, let's just hope it's close. Yeah. Uh -huh. You have the same issue with the Bible. Yeah. The New yeah. Testament was all oral for a period of time before it got written down. Mm -hmm. So who can parse what transition has happened and what, uh, you know, uh, distortions or whatever comes in by the time you get it into a text. Anyhow, it gets canonized. So I think the Greek text of Homer, as interesting that would be uh, as far as the study in itself and its transmission, that's pretty established. Then you have all these translations of it. I know mm, three or four of them. Lattimore and Fitzgerald are two of my favorites because that's what was available when we taught it at Harvard. Mm. And you can't, uh, you know, you can't quite get how they can be as different as they are, and they're still translating Homer. Right. Yeah. It seems like what you're saying, and I don't know if I have it right, but that historically speaking, in terms of human history, that the original stories were experiential. Yeah. Experiences mm -hmm. of the body. And that that came first. That was primary 
To the abstraction. See, now look, here's what, this is so fabulous. Because what happens when the minstrel sang the song, everybody went into a trance. They were hypnotized. Flat out. And so by the time you get to Plato, who is contemporaneous with literacy and writing, having just really come in to its own at all, Socrates wrote nothing, Plato wrote all the dialogues, you know, like, wow, what? In one generation? I mean, how could that have exploded the way it did? Well, it did. And so what does Plato say is, now oh, look, we can't admit Homer into our educational efforts any longer because all Homer does is induce a trance state. And how do you get people to think for themselves, which is exactly the message of Socrates, when they're in a trance? Hmm. So, banish the poets and begin to think for yourself and come out of this trance, which is Homeric. So there's a revolution in the curriculum and the meaning of education starting pretty much with Plato because he's an enemy of the trance state because in such a state you can't think for yourself. So in the early dialogues of Plato, somebody will say, well, what is justice? And they'll quote Homer. And somebody will say, no, no, I didn't ask you for a quote. I wanted to know what you think justice is. In itself, per se, that becomes kind of a technical, verbal move for Socrates. And they go, well, in itself? You know, yeah, conceptually, what is justice? Give me a definition. Now they repeat Homer again. So they had to alleviate, or let's say, you know, discharge the Homeric poems from the consciousness of the Greeks because that was their constant reference point. That's all they knew. It had never occurred to them to think about it and to ask what it meant and what you do with various definitions of it. Is justice the, the right of the mighty? Is justice giving each their due? And that's the that's the kind of conversation that goes on in the Republic in order to try to clean the concept and figure out what's the most appropriate definition. The free literal is like a magical, uh, magical culture. Yeah. Yeah. It's magic. Yep. And when you said that uh, you go to a trance, yeah. it's part of it. Now what was so hot about Harvard is that they had a scholar there named Milman Perry who had, uh, they just were beginning to catch on to the difference between the oral and the rational literate. And so Perry went to remote areas of Yugoslavia where he thought he could find minstrels who sang the songs of heroes in the tradition of Homer. And he found them. Intact transmission. And he had an uh, early form of uh, a wire recorder, and he took multiple recordings of these minstrels singing their songs and brought them back to Harvard. And so you had the beginning of the Harvard Center for Oral History, Oral uh, Culture, which was native before you know, the rise of rational self-consciousness pretty much undermined it. That's a pretty deep concept, Paul, to think about that there wasn't always thinking. Yeah, sort of I know it is. Granted that, you know, See, we, you, you can take for granted, you know, that there wasn't always reading or language, but to think that there wasn't always thinking, people, I suppose, just experienced. And at some point, you know, I think McKenna thinks maybe it's because somebody might have started eating mushrooms, and that got them to sort of start the seed of thinking or self-rationalization. But just the idea that, the birth of thinking, that you know, there was a time where people didn't really think, didn't even have the tools. If you asked them a question that required thinking, they couldn't do it because there was no framework for what, for what thinking was. Yeah. I, I it's not that uh, 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 long ago, you know, that uh, Finland went through that. 1550s, they became uh, literate. See? There it yeah. is. Yeah. A uh, bookshelf of like this of these songs, like uh, that carried the whole thousands. culture up until that point. Oh, wow. Why? Why did Finland go so late? Because uh, they were under Swedish uh, rule. 
So all the educated people have uh, spoken as Swedish or German or you know other languages. But the Finns themselves, they were like you know Aboriginal uh, uh, people in that uh, area. Huh. They've always been well, always 10,000, 20,000 years in the same place, but they were not culturally. Uh, and isolated. Yeah. By the way, but 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 this is a, I have a hard time thinking about somebody not being rational. <laughs> but 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 the rationality You're always probably it. starts <laughs> at, at reading. You know. See, I can't imagine that because I imagine experiencing yeah. in one's body. Yeah. And justice. How do you make sense again? That's right. How there but. I'm not, I'm not sure what we're talking about. We're talking about when you, uh, Daniel, talk about they didn't think. Uh, if, do we mean thinking the chatter goes on in your mind, or do we mean something else? Or maybe they didn't think, they perceived right. thoughts. But how, if you don't have some sort of reflection, uh, even in, in listening to a story, how do you make sense of the story? If there's a lesson in the story, how so do you, how that's do you why learn I the lesson? How do you learn yeah. from your experience without being able to reflect on it? So I corrected myself by saying proto-rational. Well, they're on the way, but they're not there. But yes, I remember that there, <clears throat> when there's a comparison and contrast to it, Homer, oil, tramps, follow, Plato, Literacy, anti-trance, lead. The last one is think for yourself is another effect, is another symptom of leading. You lead. Uh-huh. Right. And you know what the word for that is? Autonomy. So if you want to skip from the enlightenment... Autonomy? First of all, you can call Homer, a, let's say... They, they refer to Homer as a period of enlightenment, partly because of the Olympian gods. They've, 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 they've moved beyond the elemental deities of re blood revenge and vendetta and so on. They've got the Olympian gods. And they're already beginning to get a sense of justice because of blah, blah, blah. That all comes in with the tragedians in Athens where Aeschylus celebrates the institution of courts of law and the suppression of the former uh, eye for eye, tooth for tooth. That's one of the great expressions of the occurrence of justice in the plays of Aeschylus. He celebrates it. And one play is called the Eumenides, which is the name given to the Irenes, who are the blind forces of vengeance for spilled blood, and it all happens around uh, Restes killing his mother Clytemnestra, so the Irenes come off of her spilled blood to pursue him, and so they have a, a, a court of, uh, they have a justice, they have a meeting about it, being a court of law, and Athena presides over it. Uh, uh, hello? What is lead autonomy? Yeah, uh, so let me get to that. I'm, I'm on my way to it. <laughs> so, um, Homer's already a kind of enlightenment thanks to the Olympian gods because they're, they're the high sky gods and not the elemental powers that uh, are more primitive. So um, then you have Socrates as the expression of the complete breakthrough of enlightenment as far as rational self-consciousness is concerned and the notion of autonomy. Think for yourself. You have a centered self. You're not subject to uh, a whole field of uh, forces. You can assume responsibility for what you do. In Homer, a god made me do it. I didn't do that because I don't have a centered self that enables me to be responsible for what I did because I didn't know how to think about it. The gods are expressions of the motive forces of one's behavior. See, and they finally get integrated by the time you get to Socrates. So it becomes the autonomous centered self. That's incredible how that takes place. Yeah. And also it seems <coughs> to be a, it seems to repeat again with this Homer versus Plato in a more radically different fashion when it comes to European uh, romanticism and science.
physical scientism again. So that's a jump I was going to make from Socrates to Kant. Because you have the period of enlightenment at the time of Kant, which is, the, again, the triumph of rationalism in uh, Europe. And, you know, it all gets picked up in the Renaissance, the rediscovery of the ancient sources, so that's kind of the beginning of the whole dynamic. But by the time you get to Kant, uh, rational enlightenment has really called the shots. And it had a lot to do with overthrowing the Roman Catholic Church and the inception of Protestantism. So Kant writes this famous essay called What is Enlightenment? And he says it means uh, throwing off foreign authorities that you have never really submitted to or whatever. I mean, beginning with your parents. You finally grow up and you're not under the authority of your parents anymore. That's heteronomy. You're not under the authority of the Roman Catholic Church anymore. That's heteronomy. So what happens? You come into your own. That's autonomy. Think for yourself. Dare to know. Those are the themes of Kant's famous essay. Now, look at what the consequence is. First of all, when we talked about what happened from Homer to Plato, you have the suppression of native cultures based on oral transmission. You can't do that anymore. You've got to learn how to think. You've got to reflect on what you do. You've got to give up your native, primitive ways and become civilized like any great Athenian is. I had to laugh when I found out that the Greeks thought that everybody who didn't speak Greek was a barbarian. Yep. <laughs> By definition. Because only the Greek language was what carried culture mm -hmm. and made possible the achievement of rational autonomy and rational self-consciousness. Okay. But what a, what a price that had to be paid as far as uh, the effect on native cultures and their oral transmission of their culture. I mean, look at the American Indian. That's probably the greatest example we have in this country. <clears throat> and what, what we've done to suppress and destroy native Indian cultures, even to the point of making it illegal or completely uh, suppressing their own native language. You know, they were forced to learn English. Yeah. And they were forced to try to be uh, civilized and, uh, you know, turn into bourgeois replicas of ourselves. Kill the Indian to save the man. Yeah. Uh, do you know the, the origins of that, the Roman word civilized? I'm sure you do. Well, from... It's like to civilize, like civil meant yeah, like a right. part of the Roman society. C city. So it meant to city. Right, so to civilize was like... So then think of the earlier thing we I told you about in terms of the move from the forest into the city, you know, and what it meant to be civilized and to put behind us our forest mm -hmm. existence, which is practically identical with native and uh, yes. what we call primitive. So anyhow, you know, and then you carry through. So the Greeks had this, you know, fully... Uh, developed understanding of rationality, half of which was receptive and revelatory. I mean, they were open for that and understood it. And that's why Plato could be grasped by somebody like Socrates and transformed accordingly, out of which you get the greatest body of writings ever. And also, uh, I also want to point out, prior to physicalism, there was reductionism. Again, the idea of reductionism is much older than physicalism. You bet. Reduc it's those basic principles that allow, very basic principles that allowed various uh, complicated ideas. Well, think of the reduction of your own physical dynamics when it comes to learning how to read. Think of the price that literacy uh, uh, extorts on human vitality. You've you got to sit still. Yeah, and you know, I mean, I'm so book-oriented that I don't even want to get up to pee. <laughs> really, I mean, I, I mean I've so, become so sedentary now, I'd be happy to spend the rest of my years 
as long as I have a pile of books next to me. And my wife would feed me, and I wouldn't even have to get up to go to the dinner table. You know, I don't want to move. Okay, now, is that the outcome of literacy? Yes. And I had a shock when I was younger. One of my best friends, Rolf von Eckertsburg, we were at Harvard together. He had a little daughter named Uta, and she was as wonderful as her name, Uta von Eckertsburg. And I happened to be with them in Pittsburgh the first day she went to school. And we were all excited for her. She was just this gorgeous little girl. And she came home, we all said, how was it? And she said, the teacher kept telling me not to squeak my seat. <laughs> I thought, that's it. <laughs> I mean, there goes Uda. She's got to learn how to sit still. You know, and the whole dynamic vivacity of this little girl who was so much that, you know, just like, yeah. And then I, I've even laughed further about how literacy suppresses our thymus and our vitality here by virtue of our chin pressing on it. Now, that's carrying a little too far. But... <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, how amazing. Okay, now, the way I was going with the full Logos view of Greece, you know, the more you carry it through, the more, it want, you know, once you get to Galileo and once you get to Descartes, and once you get to Kant, and the whole you know tightening up of the show in favor of modern science, and the reductionist character that that entailed, where everything is reduced finally to matter, and matter is all that matters. And I mean that's where we are now. Now there was a whole period that's it's just beginning to be corrected, where the investigation of ancient Greece culture and Greek philosophy was basically to make them into early scientists. You know, and the whole, uh, let's say, uh, spiritual side of the origins of Greek philosophy was lost. <coughs> These guys were early scientists, and they tried to get at what the basic stuff was. And weren't they called physicists? No. Yeah, that was their name. And by physis, we meant, remember, I told you when we started out, Breath. No, that's a uh, psyche. psyche. Fusis, the Greek word for nature, meaning what grows or a plantation. So all of a sudden, these guys that are trying to give expression to what grows are called physicists. But that got to mean early scientists. So the whole tradition of ancient philosophy was skewed <coughs> accordingly. And now they're just beginning to come out of it as far as looking at all the other aspects of the pre-Socratic philosophers uh, to begin with, who are much more than early scientists just because they're trying to find the basic stuff. So, I was going to ask you, um, what do you think the major theme that I want to leave you with, what, what is it? If you had to say what I wanted to press home more than anything. Didn't so much come up today, but it, it has in other class periods. We're missing vitalism. Yeah. We're missing the timos. Yeah. We need to get that thought back. That's good. Mm -hmm. But there's still one theme that I want you to really think about. And the, the critical uh, symbol of it is like, namely, we're dislodged from reality. So everything is like, 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 like. And the, the, <clears throat> the um, glossary is artificial, synthetic, simulated, virtual, like, copy, reproduction, Like, yeah. like yeah. that's like their mind kind of like skipping back to that metaphorical knowledge, but then being trapped in this specific mode of language and mode of thinking that we're in now today. That's like the 
ancient mind as being like 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 metaphors like they had a group of authors in Vienna who are very little known. I only know about them because I had a teacher at St. Olaf that uh, was an authority <clears throat> in them. And it's kind of a Viennese school of uh, novelists, especially, at the turn of the last century. Heimato <clears throat> von Doderer, Robert Musil. Uh, Kafka is kind of associated with him, even though he was in Prague. But uh, he's, he's thought of as part of the group. Um, you know, there's two or three others. A guy named Kennedy, who uh, wrote some wonderful novels and also a famous uh, study of crowds. And uh, Herman Brock would be another one. Anyhow, these guys had the notion of a second reality. As far as industrial society displacing us from original reality, or reality reality. And they, they worried a lot about that. So one of them wrote a book called The Man Without Qualities. Was that like a proto-virtual reality? Yeah, exactly. So that we've shifted over to, let's say, the reality of our construction, which a lot of people buy. I mean, they talk about constructed reality. And there's a there's this book called The Social Construction of Reality by a sociologist whose name I can't quite remember. And the word construction is used a lot in science as far as constructing models uh, for research and so on. You make it up. So that's what these guys worried about, that we were just in a process of displacement from reality under the influence of industrial society as a world above the given world of nature, therefore another world, a, substitute world, so to speak, predicated on our artificial synthesis. And how do you get back to what's real? For a lot of people, that reality is more real than the one No that kidding, is exactly. And that's what you got to be careful of. I remember the first time I met Don Farmer, I might have mentioned his name to you. He was a graduate student here with Ralph Abraham and the whole chaos math development. Brilliant guy. He was famous for um, developing a computer that fit into the heel of a shoe with a keyboard that the toes could work to beat the, uh, uh, the wheel at Vegas. What do you roulette call the wheel? wheel. Roulette. roulette wheel. <laughs> and they could get an algorithm for the wheel, and they had to do it specifically for each wheel. Whoa. But they could figure it out. And they, they, they actually carried it through. They never had enough money to really bet. And they, they could get a little hit, but, you know, they only had hundreds of dollars because they were graduate students. They are poor mathematicians. And uh, there's a wonderful novel, or a book, not a novel, a book about this called The Oi Demonic Pie. And the guy writes up their whole effort. Well, Don went to Santa Fe to take part in the really uh, remarkable think tank in Santa Fe, which is called the... Santa Fe Institute. Or something like that. Santa Fe Institute. He's one of the principals in it. And because of being uh, schooled in Abraham's chaos math and this roulette wheel business, <clears throat> he got millions and millions and millions of dollars from Swiss banks to apply to uh, anticipating the stock market. Could you develop algorithms based on chaos math? that could beat the stock market, and he did it. And he made lots of money for these Swiss banks, which set him up with a professorship and a lifetime salary at the Santa Fe Institute. And he's just written a book called Artificial Life. And when I met him, probably 20 years ago, he was the first guy I heard who was talking about how quickly we would solve the Turing test where we wouldn't be able to tell the difference between a human being and a computer. We yeah. can still tell the difference between a human being and a machine because number one, material difference. Yeah. Look at us. But the Turing test is you have a computer in another room like over there in the call office and you can you know, co uh, communicate back and forth with it and uh, you can still maybe tell the difference with it's a, that it's a computer. But the test is such that there'll come a time, this is uh, 
Another Don't one. hold up. There will come a time where you won't be able to tell the difference. However, there is another constraint. The number of, the amount of memory reserve yeah, for I know. each machine. So you can, yeah, you bring up all exceptions like that. But here was me listening to a guy talking about it, how he couldn't wait for that day to happen. And to me, it seemed horrible. Because it meant that humans were equivalent to machines. Now there's a neurophysicist who's just written a book. He's on KQED, I'm told, talking about uh, you know the neurology of the brain, and he calls the brain a computer made out of meat. See, Paul, you're looking at it as humans have been brought down to the level of machines. This stone guy is probably seeing no machines have been risen up to the heights of humans. It's the same show for me. <laughs> you wind up with the same thing. Well, see, and you go back 200 know, years, and you got a guy who then someplace affects what you see. Oh no, man, there. it just gives me the willies. <laughs> I can't get over it. I can't believe anybody is going to buy into that. And then you get all the other stuff coming with it, like Kurzweil and, and the eventual immortality that science will give afford us. And <clears throat> I told you at one point in this semester, the worst nightmare I ever had was going to this cave in Europe and being hooked up to a machine that would keep you in a comatose state for 75 years so that you could enjoy the advances of science. Now, why did I wake up groaning how horrible, just like uh, Marlon Brando at the end of Apocalypse Now? <laughs> the horror, the horror. Well, that's Kurtz. And I don't know why. Is that Kurtz? Our why? darkness. <laughs> so, <laughs> at one yeah, Mr. Kurtz file, he did. <laughs> yeah. and, and one final thing that separates us the most, and we should keep in mind the optimist, optimism that no machine can ever outsmart a human. It is totally limited by human contribution. That's the irony of it. The ir irony of it, you must bring in a lot of human contribution only to succeed the initial illusion of a machine being smart. <laughs> Captain Kirk proved that okay. in episode... Uh... Uh, 61, I think it was. So, I wanted to get into the logical positive school, but Joe was going to talk to us about composting. You're Joe, right? Yep. Joe. So, let me set that up a little bit <laughs> instead. Um, you know, you get the drift now as far as the, you know, the two columns, the physicalist and the vitalist. And uh, we jump over from Galileo, basically to Goethe. Um, I don't even know if I've inquired into vitalists that are prior to Goethe. But that's where it kind of hits the fan because he takes on Newton. So that gave me the major uh, paradigm, you could call it, of the physicalist vitalist conflict in the uh, conflict between Newton and Goethe. Too bad Newton wasn't alive to... Um, you know, communicate with Goethe, but anyhow, Goethe goes up against Newton's optics, uh, which he takes on in his theory of color. So you have a vitalist approach to color as opposed to Newton's physicalist approach. And then you have Goethe's interest in botany, which I took to mean that he intuited the fact that botany, as a result of the defeat and elimination of vitalism, would be a science that would suffer. Botany being the most vitalist of the so-called natural sciences. And so Goethe favored botany. That's just my construction as far as why Goethe was so concerned about botany. He also was terrifically interested in minerals. He became head of the Bureau of Mines. Are you kidding? Well, it's like uh, Newton was head of the British Mint. <laughs> You know, so these guys were really uh, of many parts. And so you have that as the background for coming on to Steiner, who picks up on Goethe's botany when he does the archival organizing at the Goethe archive in Weimar. And out of that develops biodynamics, which comes here with Chadwick. So that's as vitalist as you can get as far as uh, the move from the science of botany to the technique and uh, 
method of food and flower production that biodynamics represents. Okay, Joe? Okay. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about um, Jean Payne, just because I'm doing a lot of work with compost heat recovery. But first, I'm going to put the link between uh, Steiner towards trying to stray away from Latin based thinking um, because he says that that's kind of a dangerous way of um, culminating your worldview because of so much physicalist. Um, roots within that. And, and right away you get the notion of legal. I mean, Latin being a kind of legal language mm -hmm. in that confining, but nevertheless, perfectly clear sense. Mm -hmm. And, yeah, and he, so th that was one, that was one part that he spoke to, and he also spoke to uh, learning to think backwards. Um, and so this act of thinking backwards, um, he speaks to, like, in the dream world, um, where if you, um, there's a, a quote, um, it says, um, in pure thinking, you find the self that can keep itself in check, transform thought into picture, and experience creative wisdom. Um, so this was a, this was a quote um, that I received at the uh, uh, Rudolf Steiner College and Fair Oaks. Um, which is near Sacramento, and um, this quote I took into my dream, my dream life, and kind of saw that as taking Steiner's work of thinking backwards um, and independent thinking um, to integrate that into the dream through taking a picture, a thought, <coughs> and transforming the thought into picture, and bringing that into the dream to experience creative wisdom. Mm -hmm. And then in order to really connect with that creative wisdom, thinking backwards throughout your dream. So if you begin your dream with the thought, and you transform that thought into the picture, you take that picture with you into your dream, where you start your dream. This, this is exercise you perform when you go to bed and anticipating you're falling asleep? Yes. Okay. Um, so this is kind of my attempt of taking what Steiner spoke to, huh. um, of independent thinking and thinking backwards, um, to try to understand problems that you, or questions that you're having that you cannot come to an answer to. Um, and so you start your picture, or you start your dream with that picture, and then you wake up. Can you up. give us an example of a picture? Um, so like an example, my friend was recently in Detroit, and they were having um, problems with uh, how would they work with the children in Detroit because Detroit is in such a deep struggle. I've never been to Detroit. I don't know anything about it, but they called me from Detroit and asked for my advice. And they're in a Waldorf school? Um, they, they came from Waldorf. Um, they went from first grade all the way through high school, and now they're working um, in Detroit to try to help. They're working with nonprofits, working with children okay. to try to... Um, <clears throat> give them more opportunities to Got grow it. and not be stuck in the ghettos. Yeah. Um, and so for me, I have no idea how to answer that question, so I take it to my dream world. And so I create a picture um, some of, the th of some of the things that she's doing. Some of the things that she was doing was she was planting trees with the children. So my picture begins with trees. Um, and you're actually drawing it out. Uh, in my mind, in my within mind. my mind. Yeah. Um, she would raise her money by dancing in front of the Detroit Tigers stadium um, for baseball games. And so that is in the background. Um, I wanted to create a space where there could be a gathering, a communal space where people can speak in my dreams. So there is an open space right behind the trees so that if there's any message that needs to be delivered to me through um, the other dreamers that come together, during um, that specific dream, there's a place for them to meet. Um, she's also working with them in school, so there's a schoolyard. And so I take all of these archetypes of what she's talking about and bring them together to take all those thoughts to form it into one picture. And then I take that picture into my dream, and then I start, and then when I wake up, I have that last image of where my dream ended. And I kind of have an idea of what happened throughout my dream, but I start with that. Right when I wake up, I have that last image, 
And so I take that image and I think backwards through my entire dream to the image that I started with. And you can trace your way back. <laughs> yes. Wow. Um, <clears throat> Dude, so, I, I was interested in how you can remember your dream at all after you wake up. Because mm -hmm. if you don't catch it, you know, anything that intervenes, you, you tend to forget it. It's, and I mean, this, I don't get this like a spot on every, every day. It's definitely a practice. And it's like no How long have you been doing it? Um, I've been doing it for maybe like a year and a half, two oh, years okay. now. Oh, okay. You were so excited when you came up to this. I remember you were like, yeah. this process? Yeah. And, and you don't have any trouble falling asleep when you're ready? Um, I just kind <laughs> of take, no, I just take the picture and then, I mean, once I lay down, um, if I'm laying down, like, I don't lay down in the middle of the day. So, like, when I lay down, my body knows, like, okay, it's time to go to sleep. Mm -hmm. Like, I'm just, my body's been trained that, like, when you lay down... So, how long does it take you to develop the whole picture before you fall asleep? Um, just a few minutes? Yeah, I usually... So, another part of my thinking backwards throughout is I'll think backwards throughout my entire day. So, right when I lay down, I start from that moment, and then I think backwards through my entire day of, like, what did I do throughout my day from the minute that I'm going to sleep to when I woke up? but backwards. And then that helps, what Steiner says, that helps to activate the ethereal body, which is the... Do you, does it, do you all get that point? I don't quite know if I did. Okay, I could draw on the board to show. Okay. Now, what's so fascinating to me about this is that there's, there's a guy that wrote a book about this, not related to Steiner, and it's all about how you can anticipate the future by keeping a dream book Lucid dream, and they call it. And then reading it backwards. After you've, let's say, gone through maybe 20 dreams, you start from the, back, from the last one and read it, and there'll be some kind of message to you in the course of your recalling what you've dreamt, given how you've written them down. I had a friend that took a class here taught by William Everson called Birth of the Poets mm. that changed his life. And one of the things that they... He learned that he practiced was what he called lucid dreaming. That's Castaneda, isn't it? Well, it, it's, he talks about it too. But yeah. The way my friend Rick did it was he trained himself to like when he was dreaming, he had a journal right by his. So as much as possible, when he would wake up, he tried to write it, write it before it would escape. You know, we've all had that experience of you remember the dream and it's vivid, and then within thirty seconds it starts to evaporate. In two minutes, it goes from you knowing every bit of it to you just remember you had a dream, but you can't even bring it up. Anyways, my friend Rick would write it down. we practice and practice. He got to the point where he was very good when he was dreaming to become aware of that, oh, I'm in a dream. So you're almost, your conscious becomes aware of your subconscious. So he would be able to go, oh, I'm dreaming now, which means I can do anything. And then he could do all kinds of cool things like fly or, or not worry about it because he got so good at being aware that he was dreaming when he was dreaming. That's hard to believe because usually that's the point where you wake up. Right. It's almost so like his... It took him months to get to there, and he's lost it since because he didn't keep working that muscle. But he said he got to that point where he could uh, know he was dreaming and then just kind of play with it. Huh. Yeah, I, I've had uh, bizarre experiences of lucid dreaming almost every night. It's like... I had random dreams and I know that I'm aware of it. For instance, last night I had come up with this bizarre dream about some fictitious uh, movie that involves a Japanese uh, cruise ship, Japanese, uh, where it features pop music, trying to explore to a different uh, planet. And I was well aware that I'm in that dream and I want to get out of it. It's like I keep changing channels so to get on, but couldn't. <laughs> and, but you didn't wake up either. Uh, eventually I did wake up. Yeah, eventually. Another, another is when I was going to a super long bathroom when I held a, when I actually had a tears in my mouth. I put it down to wash and brush my teeth and then I had to, after washing my teeth, I had to go back to bed, had to keep walking through, but when I woke up, it went missing. I had to scramble to find it, and then I found out that it was underneath the pillows. 
with the tooth fairy. No, <laughs> retainers were back. Uh, the retainers were oh. under the pillow. Okay. And I thought that I left it fictitious sink. I looked there, it wasn't there. Joseph, you ready? Yes. Um, so, this is kind of what I was trying to um, speak to. So, you like start your day, and then you live it, you go through your waking life, and then in the evening, you think backwards throughout your entire day, and you pick the thought from that day that you want to meditate on during your dream. And so you take that thought and you transform that thought into a picture. And then you take that picture into your dream time to begin your dream. Your dream now, how do you make the connection? How does it transfer from thinking about it in the picture into the dream? Yeah, like, I can't do that. Well, it just takes practice. Like, you like, can't assure it's going to happen. I mean, you practice it and then you get there. I mean, for me, like, I as, soon as, I, as soon as I read the... The, found the quote in pure thinking you find the self that can keep itself in check yeah. transform thought into picture to experience creative wisdom the idea of a thought into a picture like that's already like I mean in Waldorf like everything yeah. is right. done through picture and imagery and mm -hmm. like we're learning by drawing our own we create our own textbooks that we study and so I think like because Steiner was the one who talked about this, uh -huh. and I came through Waldorf education, as soon as I read it, I was just like, oh, okay, it's as simple as that. Okay. Um, but I don't know, like, what techniques are to, like, work on taking your thought that you have to transform it into yeah. a picture. Yeah. Usually what I do is I just, like, okay, I have a thought that, for example, like, how do you work with the children in Detroit? Um, so that's, like, a thought or a question, and so... I want to take, like, what is a proper scenario that I could put myself in that might allow an answer to come up? Um, and so I create that image of, like, a schoolyard with an open space in the middle, with trees, with the baseball field in the background. Just as many little hints as I can to try to, like, see what it can bring to me. And then I go in throughout my dream, and in that specific dream, it was a... Um, I, and there ended up being a uh, massive council that happened in the open space of people gathering and coming together. And everyone came together and they made masks. And then through their masks, danced around a fire and were burning aspects of themselves that they did not need. Are you dreaming now or are you looking backwards on your dream? Um, and that, that was through my dream. That's what happened in my dream. Okay. And so then I take that, and then I wake up in the next morning, and I'm like, oh, wow, and I remember little parts of my dream. And then to fill in the blank spots in between, I take the images that I have, and I create kind of like a mental timeline, and then move backwards through that timeline to fill in the rest mm -hmm. of the little gaps to get the complete dream. Could you do that at the outset, or do you have to work at that? I mean, that took me, like, I... I've been doing this practice for about a year and a half to two okay. years now, and huh. my dreams keep getting longer. Um, so, like, now I'm at dreams that are recording, like, s they take me, like, 15 pages to write. <laughs> so to, your like, recall ability is really things. increased. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and it, they just get more and more vivid. And, like, like, for example, like, last night I had an insanely vivid dream, <laughs> and, like, I wasn't even planning on this. Like, I was... Like, so it, now it's kind of just, like, happening. Like, I'll just, like, go to sleep. I just kind of, without even thinking about it, I just, like, think about my day backwards. It's kind of become almost like a second nature practice at this point. So it's not even, like, when I lay down, I'm like, okay, I need to think about, like, how did my day go backwards? It's like, when I lay down, my mind is just, like, it's like a routine. So and, are you worried um, about getting to the point where you don't get up? <laughs> No, because I look forward to waking up the next day to get the next okay, thing that's okay. done. Right now, I'm just like, especially in my life right now, like, I could just use, like, a whole extra day for every single day that I have. Yeah. You know, yeah. like, I could do, like, 48 hours in a day instead of, like, the 24, but yeah. unfortunately, I can't do that right, right now. So, I mean, I have no problem with getting up. Work on that and get back to me. And then, yeah. <laughs> start, start practicing now. <laughs> that one. But, um, so... Where this is going is um, with like independent thinking 
and thinking backwards, I look at that, this was kind of a, a side note from the, uh, the composting um, thing, but um, with John Payne, his, he was a self-taught individual, and... Um, Is he alive? No, he no. died. Um, but he was a self-taught individual, which is an example of independent thinking. Um, and there was a quote that I got from my um, teaching environmental education class, and that quote was, by teaching someone something, you are robbing them of the experience of learning it for themselves. Mm. And so that is an extremely powerful concept to have, because it's like, is, so is a specific lesson is it going to be more potent for someone to discover it for themselves, or is it going to be more potent for you to attempt to guide them in the direction of making a specific realization that has already been pre-planned? And so with John Payne, he was a self-taught individual. He was learning from his own passion to learn, and he was observing nature through the forest. And the forest is the archetype of the natural system. Like how does it, how has earth been able to survive? You look at the forest, which is like thriving there. It, the forest is able to like, the largest plants that we have on this planet are in the forest, the trees. And their ability to photosynthesize, to create this oxygen in a stationary position, they don't even need to move. They get everything that they need from right there. Like that is something that if we could learn as human beings would like radically change the world. And not only do these trees, they're, as we would say, net positive. They're producing all of this abundant oxygen which is, and taking in all of this extra carbon to help balance out this system. And the excess of oxygen gives rise to animals which become the mobile species on this earth that are able to move. And so Jean Payne saw the archetype of um, the forest as this teacher that was just like, had so many lessons that could be found through observation. And so through um, his work, he created, he believed that um, the family unit and the forest was something that could work perfectly in harmony together. And so he would have like the forest that was, so this kind of represented the forest, but he was in France where there was huge amounts of fires and so if you just left the forest and let the forest grow, then a fire would come through and clear it to begin the cycle over. And so what he did was he would instead do um, forest clearing and forest management. And so with that, he saw the forest as kind of like a battery in a way. The forest had discovered a way to store the sun's energy for generations. Um, and so it was, he was an alchemist. It was like, okay, now that the earth is, or now that the plants have found a way to store this energy for it, how can I make this energy into the form that he needs to survive? So what he would do is he saw that there would be forests that would, or fires that would come through and clear the forest. And he noticed that if he thinned the forest and took out all the lower brush, that the fire could just sweep through on the underbrush, burning the dead debris, but not burning up into the trees. And that would still lay enough ash over the soil that it would neutralize the soil, it would provide nutrients for the soil for the next eight to 10 years, and he would do this on an eight to 10 year cycle. So from thinning the forest, he would use a little bit of equipment, so there's an outside thing here of... Um, it's much like Native, Amer Native Americans of California did when they, when they want to grow higher quality edible foods like acorns, controlled burns of mm -hmm. underbushes. Yeah, yeah. What said. exactly. <coughs> and so what he would then do is he would end up with this big pile of just like sticks and branches and he would ferment that um, because he found that fermenting introduced a huge colony of microorganisms that would help to break down and help to alchemically change this form of energy into a form that he could use as more viable. And so he studied the, he studied the process of decomposition in the forest. How can the forest have such rich soil, but there's no, like, 
there's no massive cattle, they're coming through and pooping everywhere, there's not like, there's just minimal animals that are coming through and fertilizing, so there had to be some other, like all of the nutrients in the forest were coming from the foliage that was dropping down. And so he discovered that through that process, that decomposing the wood brush was everything that he needed for his garden, because through the fo if the forest could thrive and grow trees, he could grow his little garden that just had smaller plants. And so he would take the wood brush and then he would chip it down into a wood brush compost pile. And so with this, there was a wood chipper. He had a wood chipper? Yeah, he designed, it, he designed his own wood chipper. Um, he built it himself. And now if you want to, I was looking at it, if you want to get one delivered here, there's a huge U.S. tariff and you're looking at $45,000 for a wood chipper, so it's like totally out of the question. But he designed his own wood chipper so that he could do this process. And So, so wouldn't any wood chipper do? No. No? No, because um, if you think of, think of the compost pile as like a big chocolate chip cookie, and you've got like all these chocolate chips in here, and then there's some that are on the outer edges and some that are on the insides. Now all the microbes, they want the chocolate chip cookies, but they can't eat the cookie dough. And so if you have these big chocolate chips, the microbes can get to these ones, but they can't get into these. Hmm. And so that with if you have like a big wood chip shaving that's like that, and yeah, the microbes have access to the surface area, but not to the inside. So what did he do with the chipper to overcome that? Very fine wood shreddings. That's, that's equivalent to the another idea of smaller surface area, easier consumption. Exactly. Exactly. <clears throat> just, yes. just as a side note, while we're talking about wood chippers, there's a guy, Tom Ward, up in um, permaculture teacher up in Oregon. And he has a different wood chip design that produces these long strands yeah. these fibers for um, for growing mushrooms because they don't prefer the fine you know powder they want these long strands for the mycelium to run on to, so. to crowd, travel exactly along. yeah like the roots of the mushrooms to travel down so you know there's many different ways to do wood chips yeah and that's what Jean Payne said is that instead of having thick big chunks long thin huh. shavings or strands oh maybe that's where it's from then um, that's kind of, yeah, that's what he teaches. He has a book that his wife wrote that's called Another Kind of Garden. It's a little 80-page book, tons mm. of pictures, um, and this, it breaks down the whole process. Um, now, did he have any relation to Steiner? He was a self-taught teacher that had, um, I haven't found, like, where he directly was working, like, with Steiner philosophy, but he was using a lot of the independent thinking, and the um, transforming the thoughts into pictures to understand. Did the you make any reference to biodynamic? There are teachers that come to his property that kind of compare the way that he works okay. with the land in a biodynamic fashion, where he is literally, it's a complete closed loop system. So let me finish closing this loop. Okay. Um, so, what he would do is he found that fermenting the brushwood he could put into a little anaerobic digester that would produce methane. And then this pile would break down to complete, to create fertilizer that he could fertilize back into the forest as well as into the garden. And in the middle Is the home. So the garden produced food, and through, and through this, the methane could be used to power the equipment. He would use methane to as a wood cook stove for his house. Uh, methane wood cook stove. Does methane clean burning? So he had a filtration process that there are a couple other, um, like through the fermentation process, there would come other trace um, levels of other gases. And he had a filtration, it was bubbled through two little, um, they're like, they're kind of like the cider things that you would make. They're like, kind of like that. And he would just bubble the methane through that. 
and the fluids would capture all of the other um, micro chemicals that were coming in, just like the trace or the trace elements of the chemicals that were coming in, and then he could use that for clean burning on his um, methane stove. He could run his wood chipper off of it. He modified the carburetor on his Citron 2CB truck to take methane compressed gas and off of five cubic meters of methane he could drive like 62 miles. Um, in about 70 days he could produce about 106 cubic meters of methane. Um, so that's like you could travel in 70 days of collecting methane you could travel 1,200 miles about in your vehicle. How do you store the methane? He, so he would store the methane, and so from this, the methane would come out of this, and he would have inner tubes stacked up, and he would have it. They would each be tied to a piece of wood, and then he would put a piece of plywood over the top with a rock, and that would pressurize the system. And so that system, once pressurized, all you have to do is turn on the valve, and the methane starts coming out because it's pressurized. Hmm. And then, so through that, all you have to do is turn on the valve in the house. You could, he could use some of the methane to run a generator that could compress the <coughs> methane into a smaller canister that he could put into his vehicle so it would be compressed natural gas. And then basically from here you're just contributing labor to this, labor to here, labor to here. And then through his fertilizer, because of the way he was, um, he was preparing his compost piles, um, in his book, he says that between the months of November to May, there was no watering necessary. Um, even in the dry um, province, it was in province France, which is a very dry, arid area. He had 400 hectares of land that um, was super rocky terrain. And you can see in the, in the book the pictures from the beginning of the book to the end of the book, as the book is being written, and as he's developing his technologies, just the level, the, the way that the plants are growing, the health of the plants, you can just see it transform as this technique becomes, is used more and more. Was there the a prohibition about using vegetable matter or manures? What do you mean by a prohibition? Well, I mean, you said it was totally free of that. Um, oh, only no. wood chips. So he would, like, if there, he was also a goat farmer. Yeah. So he was bringing in, he was bringing in goat manure yeah. into okay. these piles as yeah. well. So it wasn't like, he could, it's he was just, just using, chips. yeah, no, he okay. was using his, like, his compost pile was mostly wood chips because that was his abundant resource. Yeah. But also, yeah. Um, like, in the compost water heater that I'm building um, down at Caspis, yeah. I'm using horse manure as my Kickstarter. Okay. And so horse manure, like any manures, they contain high biological, a high level of biological activity, and they can help kind of be the culture starter, or like for a kombucha, like the mother, and then you can take a little baby from that to start a new kombucha. It's kind of the same thing as you, you take a base population of microbes from your manure, put it into the pile, create the conditions for those microbes to thrive, and then they populate the entire pile eating apart all of the wood chips and breaking down all of the cellulose, the nitrogen, mm. and then leaving a little bit of lignin and tannin left in to kind of hold um, the structure of the wood because that couldn't be broken down. And then he would mulch over all of his crops. Um, something that he could not figure out and any of the people that came to his land to figure out was how he was able to take such a carbon rich um, material, um, fertilize his plants, and his plants would grow with no nutrient deficiencies. Mm -hmm. um, and I can't remember the name of it. I'm, when I was teaching my class, I've been trying to find the article that wrote about it, but there was a professor that um, proposed a, I can't remember the term that he called it, but it's basically down on a, um, an elemental level. Mm -hmm. um, certain elements changing to other elements through this decomposition process, hmm. which at this point, according to the Western science um, paradigm, sure, doesn't happen. Right. Um, but, it, but according to them, it, does, it can happen on an atomic level, hmm. um, just not on an elemental level. And so this is kind of taking it one step deeper um, and going, and I've talked to some people who are doing, um, my friend, he does like quantum physics a little bit, and he's played. Or he's thought about the idea, um, but we haven't really been able to put a finger on it exactly. 
um, and I'm looking for the article because when I was talking about it um, in my class, I have like a little bit of notes on it, but I don't have the actual article. For, I forgot to write it down. Yes. So you know about organic matter in the soil, mm -hmm. the percent of the soil that's organic matter, and I would imagine that that is contributing quite a bit of organic matter uh, to the composition, which would increase plant health, carbon, and you know wood chips that can quote rob the soil of nitrogen, right, and bind up nitrogen. Instead, it's like fermented, decomposed, aged really stable stuff. So, uh, you know, I, I'm not at all discounting what you're saying in the inquiry you're on around, you know, atomic um, and elemental shifts, but more just thinking on a very base sort of farmer level that I bet that stuff's just kick-ass organic matter and would be a great thing. And it does have a huge holding capacity. Right, yes, sponge. Um, yeah, exactly. It's like a sponge. So, what little um, other plant nutrients that are within the pile, um, and I haven't done any specific scientific tests myself on this yet, but what I'm expecting is that it's similar to biochar in that it just yeah. holds up all of the nutrients, and what little bit there is, it just kind of traps it up, and then slowly, over long periods of time, has a very slow leach that kind of releases right. it out. High cation exchange capacity, high yes. organic matter. So I'm a little lost in terms of dreaming this Steiner in the class. Okay, so um, just the idea of biodynamics and whole systems thinking and utilizing, creating as close to as possible a closed loop system with what you have on the farm. Okay. Taking what you have and making it what you need because everything on this earth is essentially sunlight and it's been alchemically transformed into a tree, into a leaf, into wood chips, into concrete, into a vehicle, into fossil fuels. It's all sunlight. And so... This oh, so that reminds me of the very common uh, meditation where you rely on meditation, where you practice taking off your glasses, staring at the sun for some time, blinking, you get all nutrients from the sun, where you do not have to really... Uh, eat food after practicing it for more than 40, for 45 days or more if doing it. You know, the only, the only story that I've heard with that is the guy that was going around teaching it got caught eating at like McDonald's or Burger King. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, the breatharian. Yeah. yeah. Um, and the sun, the sun gazing kind of goes long. Now the only thing um, that I have, another thing that I've heard about along those lines is actually if you look at the sun during sunrise or sunset with your eyes closed and then you practice looking all the way to this way, all the way that way, all the way up to the, all the different maximum extremities of your eyes, then that helps to improve your vision. And there's the Bates been, method. The what? The, the Bates method. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. The Bates method. I didn't know what the term was yes. for it. But that's been shown to improve vision on like multiple different examples of people testing that. Um, but yeah. Bates vision? How do you spell it? B A T E S. B A T E S. The Breatharian um, actually came to Santa Cruz. Yeah, he was and, here. Uh, I met him. And he started, I think it was in uh, the Bay Area, he started a Breatharian restaurant. I've never been there, but a friend of mine went and said the food wasn't very good, but the atmosphere was great. <laughs> so, now, don't forget, this is a perfect illustration of the Greek word for nature. Uh, first of all, hule, which means forest. That's kind of like the, uh, almost the subsoil. And then, this is the, the plantation. <laughs> So, and that's uses, P-H-Y-S-U-S. So this, this word goes to matter, and this word goes to physics, which is, you know, like the total opposite of this. So that's a perfect uh, illustration of the etymology of, of uh, forest and nature. Well, I, I mean, I think we, like, as a human species, like, we were once a keystone species. I mean, some might argue we still are. Um, we've just kind of gotten distracted by modern society and all of its ways. But I think, like, we were naturally a forest <laughs> species, and we were 
living within the forest and finding ways to live off the land in that way. So I see that this is almost kind of an extension of like a modernized way of living as a keystone species, managing 400 hectares of land and creating essentially almost no carbon footprint through that lifestyle. Um, yeah. See, in the, the closest reading we have to exactly what he's described is the excerpt from the book Pharmacology, yeah. F-A-R-M-A-C-O-L-O-G-Y, which proposes just this kind of lifestyle.